Thank you, Martina, and good morning, everyone. Um, now that I've been introduced, I don't need to spend any time talking about myself. Um, we have, in effect, two sessions to go through, and we plan to go through them uh, back to back. Um, the the way that we are that, as you see in the program, the way it's structured is that in the first in the first session, we'll have examples of energy efficiency programs and portfolios. And uh, to discuss uh, th this particular topic, what we tried to assemble here is a, an eclectic panel that covers what, in our understanding, is the entire gamut of uh, sort of sources you, you would want to touch base with when considering the option. So uh, we have uh, on, on this panel, I'll introduce them all right now so that you get a feel of uh, the full range of speakers. And then uh, I'll ask them to come up and speak on their specific topics. Um, in the order in which we will start uh, is first Wang Xiaodong, who's come to you from Beijing, from the World Bank Beijing office. And she's going to focus on China and will highlight the experience with uh, energy efficiency targets uh, being sort of stoked into a demand for, for the activity in, uh, specifically in Shanghai. Um, then sort of uh, giving you a flavor of the regional approach to this, uh, Gonzalo de Castro from CAF will talk about the uh, institutional overview and uh, the examples of projects. Uh, in, a, in a moment of weakness, just before this session, he said that he wasn't very sure that he was um, sort of able to put together expertise on energy. And I told him that I have expertise on neither energy nor finance, but I'm still here, so you'll be doing all right. What we want to hear is from the finance people how they look at this sector. Um, moving on, Dana Kupova from EBRD uh, will talk about uh, products in the municipal sector. So we're trying to give you a snapshot of ESCOs, people working in the city space, and uh, EBRD's experience. Uh, I presume I got that right. <laughs> um, then uh, we'll uh, sort of uh, see how this sort of works in the private sector arm of the World Bank, the IFC. Uh, Harris, over there in the corner, Lipiridis, he, he talks about uh, this from the business advisory uh, angle in terms of how the IFC approaches uh, energy efficiency financing. And then for a sort of touch of reality, we'll bring in the private sector. Uh, Sami Kamel from GE Power will close out this discussion and uh, tell us how it really is in the world out there. Um, my instructions are to keep us on time. I realize that we are already late, and uh, I'll still try to, make, to, to have us wrapped up by um, 1.30. So I'm going to uh, request each panelist to take about nine minutes. I'll give you a two-minute warning in good American football style. At seven minutes and at nine minutes, I'll come and shake your hand. Is that OK? <laughs> All right. So Shadong, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, first, uh, to uh, thank ESMA for inviting me to be here to present our uh, low carbon city in Shanghai uh, project. Try this one. Oh, okay. Okay. Technology. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we need some ICTs help. Uh, well, first, um, um, I just want to sort of set the stage for uh, give a context of Chinese government commitment, energy efficiency, uh, emission reduction, and the low carbon cities. Uh, at the national level, the Chinese government is committed to reduce its carbon intensity uh, per unit of GDP by 40 to 45 percent from 2005 and 20, uh, to uh, 2020. And about 80 percent of that emission reduction will come from energy efficiency. Uh, so this is the, the bulk of the emission reduction opportunity in China. 
So Chinese government at national level set a target to reduce the energy intensity by 20% for the last five-year plan and 16% for this five-year plan. And this target was allocated to each province and also 10,000 uh, energy intensive enterprises in China, which counts about two-thirds of energy consumption in the nation. Um, for the next <coughs> five years, starting 2016, the government is now moving towards to setting a total absolute amount of energy consumption cap uh, moving forward, not just intensity. And in addition to these you know, stringent targets, and the government also provided you know, generous financial support, about 25 billion, billion start with B, billion dollars uh, uh, financial support uh, over the last five years uh, for energy efficiency, uh, including this reward fund. And the rest of the emission reduction would pretty much coming from the renewable energy, the clean energy mix. So the target is that the non-fossil fuels, renewable and uh, nuclear, would count about 15% of the primary energy mix by 2020, from about 10% now. And this is driven by the feeding tariff. And the cities is really at the forefront to achieve governments this emission reduction target, because Chinese cities account for more than 85% of energy-related emissions. And the emission per capita in large Chinese cities like Beijing and Shanghai already very high, more than 10 ton per capita. So in order to address this issue, government have a few sort of municipal level initiatives, have 42 pilot low carbon cities, particularly uh, try to pilot carbon carbon trade in uh, five cities and two provinces. Uh, so the second part, so I want to just put a sort of a, a principle, you know, we follow uh, to uh, address this, uh, uh, to contain the rapid urban energy growth. So I call this sort of three-leg stool approach. Uh, one, of course, is the energy, both on the demand side for efficiency and the, the supply side for uh, low carbon energy supply. But also I want to uh, uh, highlight this uh, you know, compact urban design, <coughs> the urban form, because in China we see many cities are going through the urban sprawl. I think this is also typical in many developing cities. And we see this study, I think the most striking to me is the one of studying Toronto, um, uh, Canada. In the city center, in the dense uh, uh, high rise you know, uh, area, the emission per capita is 1.310 versus uh, in the suburban area, the very you know uh, uh, low density you know single house, the emission per capita is 13 ton. So it's a 10 time difference, largely from the urban form. So that's the differences can make. And the third is the screen mobility, you know, public transport, clean vehicle, clean fuels. And on top of that, I also have this sustainable lifestyle. I would say that if every Chinese, like American, uh, drive SUV, live in a suburban big house, then you know none of this would be sustainable anyway. Um, the third part of my presentation is really want to put a so analytical framework for our project, how, how we develop our project. Uh, I sort of put it as a three-step approach. We may first sort of have Shanghai uh, municipal government invited us to go to help them build low carbon city. Uh, we started to look into, you know, many Chinese cities now like to call them low carbon city. It's like a fashion, you know. But what is low carbon? It's no really standard criteria. So when we first started, we uh, uh, helped them develop this uh, abatement cost curve to set low carbon objective and to define a cost effective investment program. And this was the first, at least at that time, we applied this sort of bottom up approach, a survey approach to uh, build this curve. And also we add a sort of a third dimension in terms of ease of implementation on top, on top of the cost and the potential. You can see that different color of the measures. Um, so based on this analytical work, we find out that in this commercial district of Shanghai, building retrofit take bulk of the emission reduction, about 70% of the emission reduction. So then the next step, we start to sort of zoom in into the building retrofit market. I call this as the toughest market for energy efficiency because in China, at least, I think uh, pretty much across the board, building energy efficiency already, you know, more expensive than industry energy efficiency. And for new buildings, there's a mandatory building code in China. 
but for building retrofit, the owners really reluctant to retrofit, and you can't really do much about it, right? So we started doing the building performance benchmarking work. I, I'm really glad to hear this uh, New York work I uh, mentioned last night. Uh, sort of the idea is to have the performance bench benchmark benchmarking, a next step sort of disclose of this information as of name and shame, you know, peer pressure. And ultimately, we hope to get to, you know, sort of some penalty mechanism. But right now, in the short term, after our study, uh, the local government issued some extra incentives uh, uh, beyond what the national municipal government offer to help sort of investment to bring to the sort of acceptable payback level the investor looking for. That's sort of prerequisite for our project. Uh, we also look at some business models, you know, how to uh, uh, bundle the small project for building retrofit. Just to give you other magnitude, the average size of projects about hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. It's very small. So how to bundle them, you know, to be bankable? You know, we're looking into like based on same ownership, like hotel chain, you know, retail chain, uh, by vendors, same technology. You know, so we look at the business model. So based on these two, we sort of designed our World Bank GEF project. So the GEF grant is really to help create a needable environment, remove barriers for these options we identified from the Bateman cost curve. And the IBRD loan is really zoomed into the green uh, building investment because the curve, you know, identified building is the bulk of the emission reduction. So, okay. So the Bateman cost curve really provides a critical analytical underpinning for the project design. And then the second piece of work, the policy really increased the market uptake uh, for the financing. And this is my last slide. Uh, the project is really um, uh, have two components. Uh, I already mentioned one is the about $4.5 million GEF grant uh, with counterpart co-financing. Really go into each option identified in the, from the abatement cost curve, from the green buildings, and building retrofit, trying to develop policies, support this online energy monitoring platform, which is essential for measurement verification, and also share some incremental costs for a new zero emission building. And on the supply side, trying to support the policy technical design for distributed generation. Right now, we look at something in, in a hospital, for example. And also support the implement of the pilot carbon trade, because Shanghai is one of the seven pilot carbon trade in China. And we look into the district, maybe among the buildings, have some trading mechanism. And on the transport, focus on the non-motorized, the, the improve the pedestrian and biking lanes. Uh, on the investment side, we have $100 million IBRD loan uh, uh, with another sort of $100 million matching from two local banks who are our implementing agency. So this is another sort of innovative part of the project is to use two local banks uh, to have a credit line in, in order to scale up and mainstream in the green building financing. And the loan is mostly for building retrofit, but also some part to cover, to cover the incremental cost of new buildings if the new buildings can go beyond the municipal building codes, become more efficient. So that's the overview of the project. Thank you. So in an emissions trading world, you would have uh, been able to sell six seconds to Gonzalo, but... Uh, <laughs> Already lost. <laughs> Over to you. Sure. Yeah. I'll do it. So where is he? Where is he? Ah, okay, here it is. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the invitation uh, to, to invite in our bank to participate in this event. CAF is a uh, Regional Development Bank for Latin America. Uh, I'm Gonzalo de Castro. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm based in Madrid, but my bank is based in Caracas, Venezuela, with two hubs in Panama City and in, uh, in uh, Montevideo. Okay. Today, I will, be, I will be brief as possible. Okay. Uh, we're going to focus, I'm going to focus on only one program. Uh, it's called C Ciudades con Futuro, which means, uh, which means translated is uh, cities with a future. 
no cities, future cities, no cities with a future, then it is a program in which uh, energy efficiency is one of the key ingredients. We, we've been listening uh, yesterday several presentations of, of cities, uh, realities, problems, possibilities, and uh, Ciudades uh, con Futuro is a CATS approach to supporting social and economic development in country members of our region. Antonio Machado is a well-known poet uh, uh, born in uh, Seville in Spain, and uh, he just uh, he wrote a, a beautiful poem. It's called uh, Caminante No Hay Camino. It's uh, like a traveler. There is not uh, uh, a set path. And it's been beautiful, be beautifully musicalized and sing by Juan Manuel Serrata, a Catalanian singer. And uh, that's uh, more or less what's happening to our industry, okay? There is not a set path. We're making the path along the way. So let's go. Uh, a quick contest. Latin America, it's the most urbanized uh, region in the world. With that urbanization, it's 80% as of now. And our prediction is it's going to be 90% for 2030. Second, 25% of poverty. Thank God, the uh, past decade, we decreased the extreme poverty to 12% from, uh, 20, from 27% now. Okay? Those, uh, of those 25%, most of them are in favelas, chabolas, uh, and ranchos, or shanty towns. Okay? It's a world's the world's region with the highest income inequality. We have the richest guy in uh, Mexico. Actually, actually, right now it's the second one, but uh, still very rich. And uh, the sec and maybe Mexico has uh, the second country with the highest inequality. Okay, it's uh, the, the, the extreme poor after Honduras, according to the CEPAL figures. Okay, uh, this means a high crime rate, social exclusion, and the most vulnerable to climate change effects. Low, uh, another key thing I have to uh, outline is that we have very low competitivity, very low productivity. We've been based on uh, exporting commodities past 10 years. That's been uh, the secret of our success. We've been, I mean, uh, we've been managing that success uh, very, very uh, proficiently. We've been, the, we've been building reserves, forex reserves, and we have more and more uh, I would say very, very uh, educated uh, governments in most of our countries, okay? Uh, along, along that, I just uh, have two more figures, is that uh, the requirements of the, of the region in terms of energy are enormous. Our, our uh, calculations is that uh, the, it's required around $70 billion per year for the next 20 years in, uh, uh, okay? Uh, for the next 20 years, just in investments in the energy sector. Okay, for us, energy efficiency is embedded in every project we finance. Okay, in that area, and this is a new paradigm we've been talking about. Maybe no, no uh, outline. Um, yes, it's been uh, outlined before. Is that uh, before we development banks, we used to focus on sectors. A sectoral point of view. We go to the energy. We have the uh, social department. We have the the infrastructure department. Now the new paradigm is going uh, multi-sectoral. Okay, it's just an integrated view and uh, and uh, attacking the problems. Now let's go to ciudades uh, con futuro. What ciudades con futuro? Ciudades con futuro. So we detected medium-sized uh, cities in uh, in the region. Let's see. Around one million, about uh, around one million inhabitants. Uh, the population is around one million. That they are not as complex as the big cities, as the mega cities uh, like Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Rio, Caracas, whatever. Okay, in those cities, we 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 just created this program to for to, with a multi-sectoral approach. We are going to we, we as a bank we are demand uh, demand we are client focused okay we our clients are our government uh, our portfolio is mainly government 80 percent sovereign 20 percent private from those 80 percent we just uh, we, we, we just inside in house okay with our own uh, with our own team we created we created this program and in this program we have uh, different different areas okay but we get requested by our country members how they want us to support them, okay? If they want the full support, we just start from the design, okay? And the design would be just 
confining into the, 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 the geographical, the part geographical of the city, just uh, trying to increase the productivity, uh, looking at the institutions, how, is the, how the courts, how the police, how the fire, firemen, etc., and always, always having just uh, been sustainable, not just sustainable from the environmental point of view, but the social and also economical one. At the end, our, our final, our final uh, end or target is to promote cities more socially inclusive, competitive, eco-efficient, intelligent, sustainable. Our ultimate goal is improving the citizens' quality of life. Okay, let's, this is a specific case. We're starting from the beginning, Fortaleza. I don't know if you've been in Brazil. Fortaleza is a beautiful city in Northeast, one of the most uh, unfortunate, uh, I would say less uh, uh, fortunate places in, in Brazil, less rich one. And this is a beautiful city which uh, we, did, we just, uh, we just uh, really uh, found that uh, the best area where this uh, city could, uh, could uh, increase its, uh, its potential in development is in tourism. From in that tourism, so we just focus first on the physical infrastructure, then environmental standards, and social and economic development. So it's just looking at like a thoughtful way of seeing the whole uh, development of the city. No? In the physical infrastructure, uh -huh, just uh, easily. Rain, rainwater, sewage, uh, urban mobility, entertainment and leisure, etc. The goal is to, to make the city increase, in, uh, economically speaking, and being a, a place, a hosting, a good uh, ecosystem for business, okay? Specifically, specifically in the tourism sector. This is how it works. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's the flow of work. And so first, we select the city. In this case, it's uh, Fortaleza, indicators, fine indicators and agendas. Big trouble with the baselines, what we're going to uh, where we're going to attack. I think we're going to talk after, afterwards about that. And at the end, just um, a quick, um, quick uh, way, how are we going to intervene? Which themes are we looking for? What amount of, uh, in, the, in one of the phases we find uh, in the stru structural project, is how are we going to finance it? Co-financing, maybe just uh, loans, losing local, local financial institutions, our uh, team, uh, I would say same, same sector, IDB, IFC, etc. So I uh, just uh, want to tell you, just it, this in, uh, I would say, uh, I'll be ready for the questions. Uh, thank you. At this rate, I'm going to set up my own trading platform. I've got an extra minute out of you as well. <laughs> Dana, can you now tell us how it looks like when you're talking to the municipal level? Uh, the uh, absolutely. I will first try to pick where is my presentation. Here we go. And here we go. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank to, to the World Bank for uh, inviting EBRD to participate uh, in this conference and in the discussion on the energy efficiency in the municipal sector. Uh, my name is Dana Kupova, and I work for the Energy Efficiency and Climate Change uh, Department at uh, EBRD, uh, which is a, basically a group of more than 40 highly specialized individuals who support preparation and implementation of energy efficiency, bankable energy efficiency projects across the EBRD region. I've prepared a, a few slides, uh, but most of the time I will be uh, uh, basically not talking uh, about the slides which are up, but um, because of the time constraint. Uh, for those who haven't come across EBRD before, uh, EBRD is an uh, international financial institution which was established in 1991, uh, in particular to support the transition of formerly centrally planned economies of the uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe and Central Asia to market economies. Uh, very recently, we also expanded our operation to uh, Turkey and North Africa. Uh, uh, the benefit of EBRD is that uh, we have our offices, our regional offices in most of the countries where we are active uh, and that gives us a great advantage especially when working with the local companies or local municipalities because we can address very specific needs and very specific uh, challenges that the municipalities face. To introduce 
the uh, why energy efficiency is so important in our region, I will uh, refer just to a single statistics. Uh, the carbon intensity per single dollar of gross domestic product in our, our countries of operations is 2.5 times higher than what it is in EU15. Now, this is quite a substantial problem, but also a substantial opportunity for the bank. Uh, to address this opportunity, the bank has developed uh, a unique, uh, unique approach to addressing the sustainable energy investments. Uh, back in 2006, we launched something that's called Sustainable Energy Initiative, uh, with the main objective to scale up the sustainable energy investments, to address the barriers to the investment, and to open up the market for new technologies, for new approaches. Uh, the business model that we introduced was essentially a combination of project investments, technical assistance, and policy dialogue, because these we saw as a pillars for addressing the market barriers. When we talk about technical assistance, this is mainly uh, related to uh, helping the local companies and local municipalities to develop bankable energy efficiency investments to address the opportunities, uh, being it in the municipal sector related to transport, upgrade of the uh, district heating infrastructure, etc. The reason why we also introduced the policy dialogue element is that while, we, while, of course, we want to invest, we also want to uh, create a sustained change in the market. And uh, from our experience, this was not possible unless uh, we helped also local governments and state governments to change the policy framework uh, in these countries to help introduction of the sustainable energy investment. Now, to, uh, basically, this approach has been very, uh, let's say, very successful because between 2006 and 2012, uh, the bank invested over, uh, over 12 billion euros in the sustainable energy. Uh, now, this covers all different sectors of the EBRD activities, of course, private sector, but also the municipal sector, uh, looking at renewable energy, uh, etc. Specifically, in the municipal sector, the... Uh, Oh, okay, the sustainable energy investments were basically streamlined into the operation of the bank. So at the moment, uh, sustainable energy investments account for about a quarter of all of the entire EBRD business volume. Now, in the municipal sector, this is even higher. And uh, to give you an idea about the volume, we are talking about more than half of, the, of all the investments in the municipal sector being related to energy efficiency. Now, this probably is quite specific to EBRD region because uh, in our countries of operation, a lot of its infrastructure has been put in place uh, during the communist era. So now, when we entered the market, there was a great need for upgrading the infrastructure. Uh, EBRD, since its establishment, invested about 5, million, uh, 5 billion uh, euros in the municipal sector. Uh, and Annually, uh, approximately last year, the figure was about half a billion euros. This gives you an idea about the overall scale of our involvement. Now, of course, because there is a variety of projects that we address in the municipal sector, from transport, utilities, there is also a need to have uh, or to introduce different business models. So. While the bank engages directly in large-scale projects, which relate, for example, to the overall upgrade of a tram system uh, in a large city or uh, a substantial upgrade of the district heating system, there are also smaller projects in the municipalities which, which we would like to address, but because of the transaction costs related to overall uh, EBRD approval process, this might not be possible. So, for this reason, we have introduced a very specific mechanism uh, where we finance smaller energy efficiency projects through our uh, local credit lines, where we use intermediaries to distribute our financing to final beneficiaries. In, in this case, these would be mainly municipalities or municipal companies. We have so far introduced these uh, credit lines in two regions or two countries, uh, one in Slovakia and uh, one in the Western Balkans, which was launched recently. And basically these models allow us to address projects which sometimes are only 200,000 euros, for example. So if there is a municipality which wants to uh, upgrade 
or undertake energy efficiency upgrade of a small primary school in Slovakia, they can uh, approach one of our partner banks and we can provide technical assistance to develop the project and then to finance it through the credit line. So this has been quite a successful model, especially in Slovakia, and we are looking at how to deploy this across our entire EBRD region. Uh, of course, there are other models which we are trying to develop and implement. Uh, one of them was mentioned here before, a uh, uh, model of where we engage private sector uh, through, for example, ESCO, uh, um, ESCO companies in the energy performance contracting uh, models. Now, these are fairly complex models and uh, we, are, we are engaging in the policy dialogue how to create a suitable policy framework to introduce this. Uh, quite recently, we have signed, uh, or sorry, we have uh, uh, the board of EBRD approved uh, a loan to one of the municipalities in Ukraine for the purpose of uh, uh, funding the development of the energy performance contracting project. Uh, however, these examples are still quite rare and there is a lot of work needed to be done on the energy performance contracting. The last uh, area that I wanted to mention, because I have also uh, a colleague here uh, from, from EBRD, Vlaho Kojakovic, uh, he engages a lot in the urban regeneration projects. And uh, uh, we see there a massive opportunity for taking a holistic approach for regeneration and energy efficiency projects in larger city areas. Uh, if you look at our region, many of our cities uh, basically originated around large industrial sites or large transport hubs, uh, which sometimes nowadays are uh, underutilized or disused and create substantial opportunity for development instead of supporting the urban sprawl in, uh, in our cities. So I would like to conclude here because <laughs> I'm aware of time. I guess my threat to shake hands with them has really got them going on time. Everybody has been under time so far. Wonderful. Uh, Karis, would you like to now talk to us about um, how this looks when you apps actually engage on district heating and solid waste and services from the perspective of IFC? Sure. Seven or nine minutes? Seven and nine. Okay. Great. So, uh, hi all. I'm Haris Liberidis. I'm from IFC, and my work at IFC is focusing on uh, advising governments on public private partnerships and also climate business. And the objective of this presentation is just to give you a very brief overview of how IFC is providing advisory services to governments and in also investment products in order to. Uh, address the issues related with energy efficiency and we will focus only on cities. Before going with my presentation, I would like to first of all thank the organizers of this conference and ESMAP for inviting us in such a distinguished panel. We're glad to, uh, to I'm following very close your work and um, this challenging agenda of energy in the cities goes across institutional boundaries and we're happy to be part of this panel. So. Uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar, IFC is the main driver of private sector development in the World Bank and has a strategic focus on climate change. And we cannot talk about energy efficiency. We cannot talk about climate change mitigation without talking about energy efficiency. And in IFC, we have put some very uh, solid and bold targets with regards to our activity in order to uh, address climate change mitigation. So we have uh, uh, targets for investment, so in terms of until 2015, we want to, I mean, 20% of our long-term finance uh, to be climate-related and also 10% of uh, short-term finance. Of our advisory projects, one out of four advisory projects will be somehow climate-related, so we're going to engage with governments on climate-related mandates. What I mean by that is mandates in street lighting, in solid waste, in renewable energy, of course, in energy efficiency. And, of course, this goes with a very... Uh, a, a very a structured approach in terms of uh, greenhouse gas metrics and mitigation. So climate change is a big strategic priority for us. And we think that uh, in IFC, uh, energy efficiency can be catalyzed by a kind of a model that we have developed that goes across advisory, I mean, starts from advisory services and ends up and ends up in investment services. So 
Here, what I provide in this kind of flow diagram is the whole range of services that we provide. I would like to focus from, uh, for your attention in the last uh, arrow, based on this, this limited uh, amount of time that we have, on the subnational finance. So what our subnational finance uh, team does is providing financing and access to capital markets to municipal governments, uh, 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 provinces, and as well as their state enterprises. And we offer a range of products, including uh, uh, structural products, uh, short-term finance, long-term finance, as well as partial uh, risk guarantees, and uh, as well as equity. So just to give you, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to go with all the kind of services that IFC provides to governments in terms of energy fees. I will just give an example of our work in buildings. So we have instituted a project, uh, I mean, a program called EDGE. I hope that I will have the opportunity to discuss it more with you in the, in the discussion in the panel. So let's think about, we have, I mean, we want to address uh, the, the opportunity in buildings, so IFC can provide uh, support in terms of the regulatory framework related, for example, with green building codes. Then we want to we work with the government in order to, I mean, to provide capacity building, but also structure a PPP, for example, agreement transaction. And then IFC is coming and investing either in terms through credit lines, I mean, green mortgages, but also directly to the, I mean, to the uh, development, for example, in a low-income uh, housing project. So energy efficiency, it's, it's a big area for us, where as, long, as well as uh, clean energy and climate adaptation. It is an area that we're seeing increased activity. Uh, we, we say that approximately 40% of our commitments is in uh, resource efficiency, which includes energy efficiency. And our commitments from 2005 to 2013 was about 10.5 billion. I just want to mention that last year, just to give you an indication of uh, our commitment to climate business and including energy efficiency, is that last year we did about 2.5 billion of commitments in climate business, which was something like more than 50% of the amount of, I mean, the, the amount of commitments that we had the previous year. So, again, resource, uh, uh, energy efficiency, a big area for us. Uh, we see that um, Europe and Central Asia and Latin America for the moment are leading, I mean, this area, the share of commitments that we have on, on this kind of business. But we are still working with uh, with other with other uh, with other regions in order to to somehow seize the opportunities there. So we want to, to somehow consider ourselves as a partner for cities and mentioning the subnational uh, so the financing solutions that we provide for cities. An example of this is the Mitici project in Russia, where our subnational team provided that approximately 10 million uh, loan to the municipal uh, corporation with regards to, in order to install something like about 180 uh, uh, heating stations and also to retrofit about 40 kilo, uh, 14 kilometers of heat pipes. So we're talking about the district heating project. The government uh, provides um, uh, a guarantee to the municipal company in order also to pay afterwards and, and, and the subsidy in order to, and the afterwards in order to pay the principal as well as the interest. I want to mention something in terms of regulation because we're talking about, in a, I mean, we're, this is a global conference and we're having colleagues from all around uh, the world, uh, we're having an audience from all around the world. We're working very close with governments in order to promote green building codes. We have done work already, we have done some interesting work in Jakarta that we've completed. We're working now with, in, in Philippines, in a couple of cities there, and also in Colombia and I know in Medellin and some other cities around the world. So what are we doing is we're advising governments you know, to establish codes on how we can institute in uh, in the regulations, green building components. And the last part of this slide is public-private partnerships because realistically we cannot think of out, uh, working with governments or, and, in order, and you know, in support them in scale up the energy efficiency kind of targets without not talking about bringing the private sector in. And currently we're working in a range of sectors related to energy efficiency. For example, we, we're having an increased activity in street lighting we, are having, we have recently closed one project in uh, Orissa that I will speak a little bit later. We are having one in Rajasthan. We are working in buildings, again, through a public-private partnership model by, by instituting in our concession agreements green building standards for the winning bidder. So we have completed this in a, in a, hosp in a hospital project in Mexico. We are doing a lot of work with waste. So, I mean, capturing the opportunities in terms of methane gas I mean, from the solid wa from the from the waste facilities, and we have actually, I think, we have uh, succeeded to do this in a very challenging environment, like West Bank, very recently. We're working in terms of transport, and we're working with uh, in uh, energy efficiency with uh, in bus rapid 
transit system with the state of Puebla, as well as um, we have developed an innovative kind of PPP model of five megawatt in Gujarat that now is becoming in, in India that is becoming replicable also in other cities, uh, in other states across India. And of course, we have increased. I mean, we have seen um, in many mandates in the district heating. Uh, adding to the Mitichi uh, district heating project that I mentioned from the subnational team, we have we have seen mandates with uh, we have seen mandates in uh, and, uh, products in Timisoara, in, also in Romania, and also we're advising now the government of Romania for the district heating cogeneration project. Lastly, I want to mention an example of the state of Odisha. I think this is I mean something that I mean the main takeaway maybe from this presentation. With Odisha we sign we have like a a part, we have developed a partnerships, and we have developed a partnership, and now we're in one state. We're working with, on six different mandates related to energy efficiency. Recently, we closed the street lighting project, which was the first street lighting, the largest street lighting project in India, and a solid waste project, which was the first one that has completed in the state of Odisha. And now we're doing the same one for another city in the same state, and we're working also with the hospital again, instituting green building standards. In low-income housing, again, green building standards with the EDGE program, and also we're replicating the model that we developed in Gujarat with regards to rooftop solar PV for, I mean, uh, for, I mean, for um, residential and as well as public buildings. So, I think I'm okay with time. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karis. Um, so, so far you've got a feel of how this is approached by multilateral or regional development banks, uh, how it's approached from the private sector arm of a multilateral development bank. Uh, let's take it to the logical uh, conclusion and uh, try to understand how is it approached from the private sector. Sami, the floor is yours. Thank you, Niraj. So I would like to start by thanking the organizers of this event for inviting uh, GE to participate in this discussion and to share with you uh, some of our experiences uh, implementing energy efficiency uh, projects uh, in some parts of the world, uh, but also share with you uh, our approach to energy efficiency projects. How do we approach this market space in general? Uh, how do we analyze this market space and how we are set up internally to go after the opportunities that are out there? Um, and I think also it's, it's a great opportunity for us to participate in this discussion because successful energy efficiency projects uh, require collaboration between municipalities, between cities, governments, power utilities, and the private sector like, uh, like GE. Um, so uh, I'll talk first about the, the methodology. How do you look at the market space and how do we approach uh, the, uh, the energy efficiency uh, landscape? So as a, as a manufacturing supply technology uh, solutions company that we, we produce tailor-made energy efficiency solutions, technology solutions for the, uh, the various opportunities that are out there. Uh, myself, I come from the division in GE that focuses on the supply side when it comes to energy efficiency, uh, but also there is a whole global team that focuses on the demand side, uh, which we call the GE energy management business. Um, it's one of our strategic focus areas, so we, uh, we, uh, we carefully look at this sector. We know there are lots of opportunities in it. We are uh, talking constantly with governments, with uh, power utilities, with project developers on how do we really develop these opportunities and bring them uh, up to, to the market uh, scale. Now, to be successful in this market space, we, uh, we are continuously working on improving our understanding uh, of the evolving needs and the challenges that surround these projects. And, um, and, and we establish this understanding, as I mentioned, being through close relationship with the power utilities and with the municipalities and uh, ministries of electricity uh, in, in different parts of the world. And through this in-depth analysis, uh, of these evolving needs and the market barriers facing energy efficiency, uh, we are um, putting together a bundle of solutions, both technology solutions but also financing solutions, to enable these projects to, to really happen and materialize. And in many cases, these support mechanisms, what we call internally support mechanisms really, are customized to the project sites or to the specific project opportunity uh, because one of the key learnings we, we have gained is that you cannot really use a cookie cutter approach when it comes to uh, energy efficiency projects. Uh, every site has its own characteristics, has its own uh, conditions, the circumstances surrounding the site and surrounding the ownership of the, of the, uh, the plant that has 
potential for energy savings. So we have customized our solutions to, to around these circumstances. Now, in terms of steps, how do we approach these opportunities? Now, the first step we do typically is we deploy our a team called application engineering team. These are the guys who go in and assess the, the site when it comes to the potential for energy savings. So they look at the whole value chain inside the, the, uh, the power plant, for example, if this is our target to improve the efficiency in existing greenfield, uh, brownfield, sorry, power plant. And they identify, design a, an optimized solution for energy savings in this power plant, which in many cases, by the way, are based in inside cities. Um, and then they look at various options of technologies and they come up with the, the most optimal technology solution for this, for this plant. And we conduct these techno-economic assessments free of charge for the utility or for the owner, the plant operator. And then we work on identifying partners. So this is a second step. Who do we need to partner with to make this project happen? In many cases, we have to collaborate with what we call system integrators. So these are the, the, the companies where, or, or service providers or the core business is to bring together multiple components from multiple manufacturers for a specific project. And in many cases, energy efficiency projects require uh, more than one component from more than one manufacturer. So for us, collaborating with system integrators and, and working with them closely is, is an essential piece of the equation. And then at the operational level, at an, an early stage of, of the project itself, uh, we, we work closely with the project owner, be it the, the power utility or the, uh, the plant operator, on understanding the potential funding requirements for, for this project after we've configured the technological solution. Now we start to look at the budget and where the money could come from, the financing would come from. We define the potential financing structures, and then we advise on the customer potential solutions and sources of financing. And uh, we also look at uh, lenders, equity investors, and other types of, of uh, uh, suitable stakeholders. And then we conduct the due diligence on the whole project after we've agreed on the sources of financing. And then after that, we offer a customized support when it comes to the financing. And these include, I'm just listing some examples here, we can support, we provide support on the trade financing, so bank guarantees, letters of credit, etc. We also provide support on export financing, so the working with export credit agencies like Exim Bank, COFAS in, uh, in France, EDC in Canada. Um, we have close working relation with all of the ECAs, export credit agencies, uh, and bring their support to our customer or to the, the, the project owner uh, we also support on the project finance piece itself, so including structuring of special purpose vehicles, for example. We have done a number of these with our partners uh, in multiple sites. Uh, and we also offer uh, equipment uh, leasing, so lease to own arrangements, for example. Some customers are unable to, to buy the, the technology solution today, so we offer them to, to lease it and then they can own it later on, on the long, uh, on the long term. Uh, and this includes products like um, uh, reciprocating as engines, air derivatives, uh, or en energy storage, also solutions for some of the African uh, countries. And finally, we also support recently of providing more support on the Islamic finance uh, piece. And this is an emerging uh, space we are, where we are seeing, especially in the Middle East and North Africa region, where Islamic finance is starting to play a bigger role in infrastructure projects. Now, to share with you some of the examples, some of the projects we're actually working on today with some of the uh, power utilities and, and cities in, in different parts of the world. Uh, so one project, for example, we're working with a, a state-owned power utility in the Middle East, uh, where uh, this power utility has uh, multiple power plants in the city. Uh, we've identified how much savings in megawatts can be achieved in these existing plants through retrofits and through uh, upgrading of their heavy-duty gas turbines. The challenge we have is that this uh, power utility has a cr poor credit rating. So they're unable to, to access uh, finance. And, uh, and so what we're bringing to them is an infrastructure fund that we have established with a, uh, um, a sovereign wealth fund in the same country. It's an $8 billion fund. G is contributing $4 billion, and the sovereign wealth fund is contributing another $4 billion. And we're, we're working with the government entity in that country to establish a loan guarantee facility where they will offer a loan guarantee to that utility, which once it's offered, this, the infrastructure fund will be willing to 
uh, work with this power utility and um, uh, pass on the technology solution to them through us, through GE, uh, and then the power utility will pay in installments based on the actual savings in fuel achieved through the upgrades of the heavy duty gas turbines. So this is a, a, a typical, I would say, business model that we are uh, uh, using. Um, I have several other uh, examples, but uh, given the, the, cons the, the constraint of time, okay. Um, we're working with the municipality of the city of Dubai on a waste to energy project. Um, we've worked with them on the construction of the landfill. Um, now they are being approached by the municipality of uh, Nairobi in Kenya, uh, in Kuwait, and Doha also have approached them saying, we would like to come and see how the city of Dubai has actually been able to generate power from its own uh, solid waste. So that's also a, a recent success story we've had. And uh, maybe in the second section of the, of the session, I'll, uh, I'll talk about what, what are the variables that we look at when we are uh, evaluating these projects. So there are specific factors that we need to cover uh, to make as part of the due diligence process, but also talk a bit about the, uh, the barriers that we are seeing and uh, maybe have a discussion around that as well. So thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists for staying within their time very with, with a lot of discipline. Um, so this is now going to become a little bit of a challenge to manage, but uh, first I'd like to welcome on to the panel uh, from Colombia, Mr. Luis Fernando Arboleda Gonzalez, the president of Findeter. Uh, please come and join us so you can take this seat. Um, <coughs> I should uh, advise that uh, our urban sector manager from Latin America, Anna Wellenstein, is sitting in the back row and she will be listening very carefully to <laughs> your description of what, uh, uh, what are the challenges that are being faced. So what we've done uh, for this session, um, and I forgot to mention, I mean, maybe some of you had questions on the presentations, but I think they were succinct enough for you to not be too distracted by that. What we've done is we've uh, put out what are considered the five typical uh, sort of uh, barriers to energy efficiency investments. Um, I'll ask each of the panelists to please take a look at these and then um, basically speak for, a, for an undefined time, three or four minutes, to, uh, to talk of whether they, this kind of sums it up and whether, uh, what are the specific challenges that they see uh, emerging from uh, their operations? I mean, Chadong could talk about collateral barriers, for instance, or um, uh, we could also uh, try to think not only in terms of outlining what are the problems, but are there solutions emerging which you would like to talk about, which uh, uh, might, be, might help to guide uh, the panelists themselves? Uh, leave about, uh, if you will, about 15 minutes so we can go in for questions. Uh, you also have the opportunity this evening to line up and speed date whichever, whichever of these panelists you want to specifically buttonhole in terms of saying, I need you to come to my city and do a contract with me tomorrow. Okay, you can do that at the speed dating time, not just now. But when the questions begin, uh, do feel free to sort of probe um, the sort of the content that uh, we have put out here. So. In uh, no particular order, maybe we just go, we'll, we'll give Mr. Gonzalez a few minutes to settle down. Uh, Shadong, you will be probably the most rested since you spoke earliest. Why don't you give us your three minute version on this? Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe okay. I just, just, this is better, yeah. Uh, yes, so. Um, Actually, besides the Shanghai project, uh, I also manage energy efficiency uh, credit line with a $400 million uh, loan with three banks, energy efficiency financing. And I noticed that the panelists talk about EBRD, IFC, actually the World Bank also financed about 
$5 billion energy efficiency renewable projects a year. It's about 40% of energy business. So actually, to document this experience, we recently published this book, uh, Unlocking Commercial Financing for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. So sort of, you know, look at what instruments to choose and when to use what, and what's the lessons learned. So to me, that uh, actually the fundamental barrier of energy efficiency financing is this mismatch between the financiers looking for AAA credit ranking clients who sometimes may not even need financing energy efficiency uh, versus those who are really in need of financing are usually the inefficient, you know, SMEs and ESCOs are not usually credit worthy. So this is really a mismatch of expectations. So that is fundamentally the, the problem. I think in terms of solution, what we have seen working with this bank um, is that, first of all, how you choose the bank, local bank partner, how the local banks are organized themselves. We have seen through our credit lines the banks from not knowing what energy efficiency project is about to then, you know, building confidence, learning by doing, uh, start to mainstream the, the business. Uh, and this technical assistance to the banks is really critical, uh, particularly for those the risk <coughs> assessment officers. We see lots of credit lines that um, in the last minute sort of shut down by this risk assessment because they don't know how to deal with the energy efficiency risk, the performance risk. So that capacity building for them is really critical. Uh, the re rewarding system for, for the bank officers. And more importantly, how to change from sort of this balance sheet financing mentality, looking for uh, a triple A credit ranking client to more sort of project-based financing. Uh, we have seen some emerging sort of uh, 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 um, new sort of model emerging uh, in some of the Chinese banks, for example, some of my clients now starting to use sort of ESCO financing using the, uh, the the, the saving energy saving revenue from the previous project as a collateral for the later, you know, ongoing project uh, without, you know, requiring the ESCOs, you know, put down their house and everything they have. So some of the, this is the emerging sort of uh, experience we have seen. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's welcome Mr. Gonzalez to the panel. Um, let's hear from you. So what is the uh, experience in Colombia uh, when you when you look at terms of barriers to financing, uh, is it at the project level? Uh, what, what do you see as the principal challenges that you are facing on the ground? Can you take a few minutes? Bueno, buenos días o buenas tardes. Eh, los retos son grandes, son, yo los resumo en cinco retos. Básicamente la falta de planeación de los municipios. Pues en, a nivel ya del territorio. El segundo puede ser la financiación que puedan tener estos municipios. La tercera, la poca capacidad institucional. Colombia tiene 1.100 municipios, de los cuales mmm, solamente 62 son mayores de 100.000 habitantes. Y la cuarta, pues también creemos nosotros que es la falta de gobernanza de los alcaldes, o sea, por la falta de desconfianza que hay. En, en, en los alcaldes de muchos municipios en el país. Y la quinta es la inseguridad, donde ha obligado a que Colombia es de los países que más tiene gente viviendo en las ciudades, hoy el 75% de la población vive en las ciudades, y creemos nosotros que en, el año, en los próximos 20 años está viviendo más o menos el 85%. Soluciones, pues la hemos venido... Conociendo lo que hace el Banco Mundial, tenemos una, un crédito de fortalecimiento institucional que vamos a llevar a 300 municipios. Eh, básicamente es enseñar a planificar, a priorizar y a ejecutar proyectos en el mediano y corto plazo. Eh, tenemos otra plataforma bastante interesante que es la plataforma para tener focalizado el crédito de fin de ter en ciudades sostenibles y competitivas. Colombia está firmando 14 tratados de libre comercio y no solamente las ciudades deben ser sostenibles, sino que también se deben ser muy competitivas con dos premisas fundamentales, que es generar empleo y disminuir la pobreza. Eh, para esto hemos, hemos hecho programas bastante interesantes para disminuir la inequidad en las regiones, un programa de 100.000 viviendas gratis para la población. Lo iniciamos hace 14 meses 
de aquí a diciembre estamos ya recibiendo 50 mil viviendas, eh, donde se le está entregando a los más pobres de la población, con unos requisitos importantes que tienen que tener un proceso de 20 hitos para poder tener acceso a la vivienda, como ir a trabajos de emprendimiento en el SENA, que es un instituto de formación, madres, cabeza, familia tendrán que hacer todo el tema de citología, todo el tema de salud, los niños tienen que estar estudiando para evitar la deserción escolar y creemos nosotros que ahí estamos dándole solución a más de 500 mil colombianos en una solución rápida, en un proyecto totalmente sostenible. Es tan sostenible y aplicado a lo de tecnología, cada una de estas viviendas va a tener conexión a internet, que creemos que con la tecnología también disminuimos la brecha digital y adicionalmente estamos en más de 100 ciudades del país dando cobertura de agua potable el 100%. Eh, adicionalmente, creemos nosotros que con la participación del sector privado, con unas reglas claras, el sector privado puede llegar a Colombia a invertir en cada uno de los servicios básicos insatisfechos. Para esto, el año pasado entraron más de 16 mil millones de dólares del sector privado en inversiones a Colombia y estamos apalancando recursos a través del banco que yo presido aproximadamente por 3.500 millones de dólares en más de 300 municipios, 1.700 proyectos de infraestructura, pero siempre con un concepto de sostenibilidad. No financiamos tubos, por poner un ejemplo, en los acueductos, sino que financiamos el proyecto total del acueducto. Yo creo que lo, la prioridad fundamental de este gobierno es básicamente, repito, reducir la pobreza y mejorar la competitividad para poder que tengan empleo. I apologize to those who didn't have interpretation facilities, but those who either speak the language as natives or understood what was said, I hope you'll have questions for Mr. Gonzalez. Um, I think uh, later on we'll come back to you, sir, about uh, what uh, has been the experience in terms of problems and solutions on the ground so far. Um, depending on the time, we'll come back on that. But let's move to Gonzalo. Um, uh, as a finance, uh, from the finance perspective, uh, what have been the sort of, is project size a barrier? What, what, what have you found to be the typical barrier and how have you addressed these uh, challenges? Sure. Uh, yeah, okay. It's not uh, mind-boggling what I'm going to say. So uh, we, we are uh, development banks. We are um, uh, we have a scarce of uh, resources, not only economical but uh, manpower, and uh, we have uh, we have seen the main 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 or, or the minimum common denominator is that uh, uh, the beneficiaries uh, the it, uh, the amount they need uh, for a certain or specific projects, okay, for uh, energy efficiency, is too big for them. Not only for uh, to say no, not to not to reach or not to uh, <coughs> economically viable uh, uh, beneficiaries, but even for, for for rich companies. Okay, it's it's a, it's a, it's an expense that they are not willing at the moment to 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 just to to render not to, to I mean to to take. So it's uh, the incentives for them is is quite first for the ones that are no, no are too, uh, they are not too too strong economically speaking. It's hard for them. And the second one is uh, they, they're not the right incentives yet. From the from us, it's uh, there too. I mean, uh, we're trying to get projects of uh, in excess of one million dollars. Otherwise, there is no way we can go. So we address those. Uh, we're we're trying. We're trying. Or we we are reaching uh, agreements with uh, local uh, funds or local banking, so they can go with uh, they can come with uh, viable projects. Okay. Okay. And outsourcing mainly. Uh, that's the other thing. It's a very new uh, industry, very new industry. So we lack of uh, standardization. Thank God uh, we have the World Bank and uh, all these uh, uh, institutions that uh, are, are just uh, starting, uh, having a baseline, having, uh, trying to have the same language. Okay, that's uh, one thing is, uh, uh, I, don't know, I would say, a white line in, in Argentina and the other one is in, in Ecuador. They don't speak the same language. You don't know if, uh, how much uh, efficient is uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, land uh, how you call uh, uh, dish uh, washer or whatever. Okay, so, so I think those are the main uh, in, in, our, in our experience. Sorry. Thank you. I, I think that is probably 
perfectly true glo globally. I think uh, uh, starting with incentives, but also looking at uh, collateral. Collateral is always a strange word to use when you're talking energy efficiency because it's a sort of counterfactual of sorts in any case. Uh, but uh, bankable size projects and then standards. I think uh, uh, we'd all agree that it's, uh, it, they should be all in that list. Um, uh, let's um, hear from from Dana. Would you would you mm -hmm. would you say that uh, there's more than this in terms of, especially the sectors that you described? Uh, uh, cleaning up is such a challenge. Transaction costs. Uh, it's not worth doing. People don't see why they ought to take that extra effort. What have you found? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that can you can you hear me well? No, I can hear you. Certainly, okay. I think it's fine. Uh, uh, I think that in. Uh, in our experience, the, the key points that you listed on the slide basically are uh, or correspond to our experience. Uh, I might regroup the barriers slightly because I think that they are in three very distinct, distinctive areas. Uh, the first one is access to suitable uh, financing instrument or, or access to financing. Uh, the second one would be related to the technical capacity and capacity of, of the municipalities or of, of the, the the player to develop a bankable energy efficiency uh, project. So it's more related to the technical knowledge and uh, ability to assess the technology availability in the market, etc. And the third one would be the underdevelopment of certain regulatory frameworks to support energy efficiency investments. And so that also relates to uh, a lack of incentive to uh, invest into energy efficiency. As an example, there is a huge need for, uh, for uh, tariff reforms, in, uh, especially in our region. And unless this happens, there, again, there is lower incentive for municipalities to go for these projects. Uh, when I talk about the, the first issue, uh, the availability of the suitable financing mechanism, that relates to the high transaction costs of uh, energy efficiency projects, which are quite often smaller, and it was mentioned here how this is tackled through uh, um, using local intermediaries, for example. Uh, the collateral, of course, again, is an issue, and quite often we need to look for uh, sovereign guarantees in, the, in this type of projects, especially in the municipality sector. Uh, when it comes to the uh, technical capacity to develop uh, uh, energy efficiency projects, uh, the way the EBRD model addresses this challenge is uh, by providing technical assistance, targeted technical assistance to municipalities to help them to identify their needs and uh, not only technical needs but also financing needs. Uh, because sometimes there are projects uh, uh, where, let's say, if, if the municipality looks at the overall energy efficiency investments which is required, they will quite often arrive to a figure which it goes way beyond their budget. Uh, what can be done is, as was mentioned before, uh, start with smaller investments and then finance additional energy efficiency investments with the savings from the initial project. And this can create a vehicle for delivering energy efficiency project across municipality. And of course, the last one on the policy dialogue, I think it was mentioned before, uh, critical element. I hope that summarizes. Thank you. No, it's, uh, we're going to open it up in uh, just a couple of minutes, but uh, is you mentioned a fairly sort of uh, healthy pipeline of things that IFC is doing on the advisory and investment sides. But have the challenges are there for sure. No? Have, you <laughs> have you got this figured out in a way that we haven't? Or uh, is it just that you've had um, clients that were ready? What was the experience? And uh, there must still have been problems. So what were the problems that IFC faced? So thank you for the question. I think in the end of the day, energy efficiency projects across different sectors and across in different regions are all different. So we're not talk, we're not we cannot talk about a model that can be replicated very easily across regions and I mean from one project to another. And what essentially I mean, looking at these kind of challenges that uh, you put there and thinking of energy efficiency maybe as like a puzzle picture, I would say that all these somehow stand next to each other and fill each other. So, because if you think the, the functions of an energy efficiency mechanism, what is it? It's about a packaging function related with, the, I mean, how you conceptualize the energy efficiency project, how you market it, and how you design it. And also there's a financing uh, aspect. These are the two aspects. And you have to be balance this kind of approach equally. And what actually this is translate to big transaction costs, and once you bundle projects in order to be bankable, 
you end up with the need, I mean, for, for collateral. So the challenges are there. Uh, from our experience, I mean, considering again the, the basic delivery mechanisms of energy efficiency, so loan repayment schemes, ESCO financing, utility, the demand side management that we're not doing so much, uh, frankly speaking. We can think of, I mean, and thinking about the technical, I mean, commenting on the technical capacity, we can say from our experience that the technical capacity of the ESCO industry in general in India, China, Brazil, I mean, is there, I mean, exists. So we can very easily work with, with ESCOs and, I mean, I mean, are very knowledgeable and they have the technical capacity. Of course, there are issues in certain municipalities, in certain states, but in terms of the knowledge of the ESCO industry, that, I mean, somehow is a partner in order to promote and scale up the energy efficiency projects, I mean, it, it exists. So these are the kind of, uh, I mean, basic issues. The, the issue of collateral is becoming very, I mean, very relevant to district heating projects when we're talking about assets. So, I mean, it's, it's very easy for people to realize, I mean, to consider, I mean, the collateral as the, the asset that uh, the cogeneration facility in terms of the heat is, is coming into, is, is, is coming into to the project from, a, from, a, yeah, from, from an energy efficiency perspective. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's our no, approach. Thank you. No, I, I think the experience also emerging is that, um, as in the case of India, where the climate law basically assigns a baseline to each of the <coughs> top 500 industrial houses. Uh, it mm. Effectively, it then sort of sets in motion uh, the market and everything else because uh, they have to do it or pay a penalty. Uh, in Rio, this, the thing that uh, Same described this morning, uh, there's a climate law which sets out a baseline for the city. Uh, so they have a nominal target and everything else, then the policy side of it is extremely facilitated. But uh, I'm happy uh, to be attaching this, so I'm sorry for interrupting, but I mean, the case of, I mean, for example, in India, the, cli the law that they have established in a federal the level for the city. buildings, yeah. I mean, we have seen that not being ratified in several states. states obviously. So, yeah. so there's a great opportunity, and we're trying, I mean, to, I mean, actually through our agreements, I mean, for, for the concessionaires, for the private bidders, I mean, to implement actually the law that has passed in the federal level, but has not been uh, uh, there yes, in, in, in several states. Yeah. Sure, so these are the kind of the challenges that we're facing. I'm sorry but for interrupting. Let's, no, no, it's not, that's absolutely fine. This is a discussion, but uh, then coming to Sami, you, um, did you have some take on this? Are there uh, pieces of paper out there, power purchase agreements or other mm -hmm. carbon uh, agreements or things that could be collateralized? Is there, is there some, uh, something else that you see which uh, isn't in this list? Well, from, from our experience, uh, Niraj, uh, I, would, I, mean, I agree with what's in the list. We already see these, these uh, barriers to the project we're trying to develop. Uh, I would add two more barriers to, to the list based on our experience. The first is energy subsidies. So subsidies are really distorting the, the whole investment assessment, you know, when you are looking at uh, is it viable or not because of the, the end user or the, the owner of the facility is not really paying the actual price or cost of, the, of uh, fuel, if you will, or, or uh, energy. Uh, and we see that in many countries, many customers we work with uh, are enjoying high levels of subsidy. So really when we sit with them and do the calculation, it, it doesn't add up. So uh, our approach has been to go to the macro level, have a macro level discussion with the Ministry of Electricity, Ministry of Oil and Gas, and show them the, do calculations for them, actually we've done inter internal studies for them on the opportunity cost of the fuel saved due to energy efficiency solutions, either on the demand side or on the supply side. That fuel saved, how much it would bring to the country if it's exported at the international prices. So this has been one approach. The other, the other challenge I would, I would add to this list is what we call internally in GE the uh, budget disconnect. So we've come across situations where the entity that needs to invest in energy efficiency solution is actually not the entity that will gain from the investments. You have, you have a power utility that has a series of power plants. They need to, they can upgrade their plants and, and gain hundreds of megawatts put on the grid at a low cost compared to had they added new generation capacity on the grid. But then if they do that, actually the savings and the fuel are the benefits are, are actually accrued to the national oil and gas company who's been shipping this fuel at a very subsidized price to the, to the utility. And uh, again, we have taken the discussion up to the macro level and sat with the Minister of Finance and Minister of Electricity, those who have a bird's eye view of the national budget, and shared with them the macro effect of if you upgrade your plants, this is how much fuels you will, you'll be able to save. 
Um, in power purchase agreements also we've seen in the same countries we've seen where they have uh, power plants that are owned by the private sector or run by the IPPs. The structure of the PPA itself does not reward energy uh, efficiency. It does not reward additional kilowatt hours uh, available for sale or fuels saved. So we've, it's been difficult trying to modify existing PPAs. But we're t what we're trying to do now is we're working with the regulatory entities to, <coughs> so that for the new PPAs would have clauses that would award uh, or reward, I would say, I would, I would say uh, fuel savings or additional kilowatt hours put on the grid. Thank you. Lots of food for thought. And I, th I think the experience in across countries, is it comes <laughs> back to this discussion on incentives and mm -hmm. the fact that uh, either the consumer or some other form of subsidy is sort of taking up the slack where you're trying to be more energy efficient uh, really is a challenge for forcing people to think energy efficiency sure. because they're not seeing any gains to their balance sheet. That's absolutely right. Let's open up. We have about uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, are there mics on the floor? Uh, how are we doing this? Okay. So can we have three speakers, three questions, please, and then we'll open it up. I see two over here, and I see a third one. Uh, if you'd please uh, identify yourself and indicate which panelist you'd like to ask the question to. Um, we can uh, take three questions at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John K. Barre from uh, Nairobi City County, Kenya. I have uh, probably an observation and a question. I want just to observe from the gentleman from the GE particularly the Dubai project, because we have had challenges on a sanitary landfill in Nairobi, uh, and particularly its location, whether there were any challenges for them to give technology, technological solutions or advice on the location of the site, looking at the Dubai city, and probably the location of the international airport, whether there were any challenges, so that we can learn from it and see how to give a solution to Nairobi's case. Uh, the second one is to Mr. Charis. Uh, I wondered uh, whether the, the type of solution they are giving on uh, the design, the building design, whether it's just a one-off or is comprehensive enough also to cover the issue of scheme designs particularly for land subdivisions because energy efficiency is embedded on how uh, the plots are located or the structure of the city so as to enhance energy efficiency. Because I think he only talked about the building design and uh, if that is involved and how that would enhance energy efficiency. Thank you. Okay. If I take you to another question, you have a question now? First of all, I thank the World Bank for allowing my husband to uh, bring me along. Uh, my question is uh, about how I deal with the elementary school. How do I empower them on the hands-on uh, engagement on energy efficiency? And then to Mr. Gonzalez, uh, could you kindly come back? I only found you. Uh, talking about school dropout, I don't know what connection you had. And then finally, I stay at the, uh, in the outskirts of Nairobi, uh, where greenhouses are really coming up. How do I advise these people without hurting their economy? Okay, so first question here. I guess the question on the hands-on engagement is for anyone to respond. I think yesterday's discussion on democratization of energy had some pointers for people to say just sit, sit down and translate what all this kilowatt hours and electricity bills what does it mean for you but anyone you'd like to take a shot at that you're welcome from yes I guess, uh, from Bhutan thank you I'm Kille from Bhutan I'm the mayor of the capital city in Bhutan uh, first of all thanks to World Bank and the uh, city of Barcelona for hosting us here uh, it has been a uh, experience listening to all the speakers uh, I have two concerns. Uh, first, it's on the, uh, as a city, we are trying to uh, improve our street lighting system. Uh, we have over 2,000 such lightings, and uh, we need to upgrade those to improve our energy efficiency. I think it's a cost to us. 
in the long run, the city is supposed to become self-sufficient uh, in the long run. So we have to upgrade this. So from the bank's uh, perspectives, like I I the IFC or any other bank, uh, if there is any sure. way that we can look at it. And uh, the other option is uh, Bhutan being uh, uh, carbon negative. We are working on to become more negative because uh, for Thimphu City, we have over 35,000 cars and we need to work on public transport. Now, that too, we are even looking at electric buses to fly in Bhutan. So this morning, uh, we heard the chief uh, planner of Barcelona talking about the electric buses. And we would definitely would like to know how this can be sources, uh, sourced and be used in Bhutan. Thank you. So wonderful operational questions as well. Um, if I can take the liberty, uh, the lady you're sitting next to uh, will probably be able to help you connect to the World Bank Institute's uh, sort of learning portal on sustainable energy. Uh, that has a, a couple of uh, e-learning things on how to change uh, your city's lighting system. Uh, examples from from CFLs, not LEDs, but uh, we do have, uh, we have tried to analyze what has been the experience. But let's open it up to the others. I just, because I had the mic, I took the liberty of uh, addressing the last question first. So, um, Sami, there were some questions to you on... Um, yeah, the Nairobi, uh, Nairobi. landfill, yes. So, uh, I happen to be part of a team, actually, in GE. We're working with the governor of Nairobi. Uh, on the landfill site, identifying the site for the city. Uh, yes, we are aware that the current site is close to the airport and that has been causing some, some challenges. And we are in the process actually of identifying another an alternative site to, uh, to build the, the landfill in there. In the case of Dubai, uh, it was, we were lucky, I think. Uh, the site there was far away from the airport. There was no issues around the site, so we just went ahead and, and uh, built the site with the developer or the project developer. But uh, on the Nairobi piece, uh, I, would I would be glad to take uh, the discussion with you also offline and, and I'll update you on more details on where things are uh, when it comes to the landfill there. Six o'clock today, if I may recommend you <laughs> set up a date. Yes. Uh, there were questions on building design one-off. You want to address it now? Sure. Uh, in terms of building design, I mean, I totally agree with your comment. I mean, if you want to have a holistic approach, you have for sure, div I mean, design on a neighborhood, on a neighborhood scale. So the experience is that many, I mean, so how IFC is, wor I mean, is working is out of the mandate, of course, and we're working very close, I mean, to, to de and we don't have the capacity to go through very big urban development plans, but we're working very closely with, with um, and we're following with our colleagues in the bank that they are in the urban sector that are supporting this kind of work. And uh, real, I mean, and also an example of is that maybe, I mean, sometimes uh, we have an example of a project in Mexico that we uh, finance, um, a low-income house a real estate developer through our this kind of phase program that I referred to and uh, in order to integrate uh, sustainable design for buildings in the in the in the real estate uh, areas that he's developing into his business model so uh, out of I mean it's out of the scope I mean uh, of I mean, the general neighborhood scale uh, approach uh, from IFC I would like to touch also on the school hands-on experience. I think this is the challenge <laughs> question yeah? from, from a panel of bankers. And so three things there, I mean, at least the way that I think. The first one is the design of the school itself. It's totally different. I mean, if, if children are, I mean, in a school that is environmental friendly, has, I mean, are, are learning from this. The second thing is that the role of the school in the community and how this, I mean, how the, the children, I mean, inform their parents and their community around the school about the, the benefits that an environmental design offers. And the third one, and this is a government issue, is how do you develop curricula in the school courses related to energy efficiency. So these are the three areas that I can find, I mean, that are, I could think of very hands-on related to energy efficiency for schools and the next generation of uh, citizens in, in Nairobi. Thank you. Uh, we have time for, uh, any, anyone have advice on electric cars for the mayor of Timpu. Uh, okay, maybe they want to talk to you off, offline as well. Uh, let's do another round of questions if there is any interest. We have about two or three minutes. Are there people who have questions for the panel? I think there's one here. This is 
home, homegrown. So if, is Petsy the only one? Okay, Petsy, you have the last question. Thank you. Uh, my question is for GE, actually. So you say that before you do any financing with the, power, uh, with the power plants, you sort of go in there and do some kind of analysis to get a sense of what is the energy efficiency uh, opportunities uh, that are within the other uh, power plants. I'm curious, so who pays for that? Because in most of the cases, we find that most people don't really know what the, what the opportunity is. And in, in order to assess that opportunity, they need some money. They need to be able to pay for that. But then they don't have the money to do the assessments at the, at the, at the very beginning. We, uh, we actually have an internal team called the energy consulting team. And uh, this team gets, we deploy them at, the, an, at an early stage of the project cycle. And they go and they conduct the energy audit of the facility. Um, and um, I would say 95% of the cases we cover it from our own balance sheet on a grant basis to, because energy efficiency has a big, ch ch big piece of energy efficiency as on education. You need to raise the awareness and sit with the plant owner and tell him, by the way, if you do X, Y, and Z, be it technological change or behavioral change, here is how many megawatts you can add to, to the grid. And in many cases, it's been successful. I would say that once this number is presented to the plant owner or the Ministry of Electricity, uh, then they really start to, to look at how can they work with us on, on delivering this additional megawatts on, on the grid. Mind you that also from an economic point of view, uh, it's, it's costless to add one megawatt on the grid through savings rather than through adding new generation capacity. Of course, uh, at, at a certain, up to a certain limit and then it becomes uh, cheaper to, to add new generation capacity. But uh, to answer your question, it's, it's covered from our own uh, budget and we do it free of charge for the uh, plant operators. Of course, there is a scale to what extent, I mean, I'm talking about multi-megawatt savings uh, rather than a uh, small scale, uh, uh, because the transaction cost, as, as mentioned, it would be too high for us if we do this, uh, you know, tens of these uh, at our <coughs> own cost. So typically we, we focus on the large scale, especially that I come from the supply side uh, of the part of the business. So obviously, I mean, you do some kind of pre-selection of these power plants, right? Um, and I think earlier in your presentation, you said there's sort of a certain criteria that you use to, to, uh, to choose. Is it possible for you to go through that as well? So that, I mean, when we are out advising the cities, we can say, if you meet this criteria, maybe you should call GE, they can help you with some of the sure. uh, energy orders. Well, typically, the, the, what we look at, we, we, we look at across all of the power plants owned by the power utility in, in a country. And um, we look at things like the ownership structure of these plants privately owned or uh, state uh, run power utility of course the, uh, we look at the if there's a power purchase agreement to look at the details of the PPA um, we look at the fuels dynamics how much are they paying for the fuel where the fuel is coming from is is the fuel is subsidized or not um, if there are additional megawatts av made available can these go on the grid can the grid capacity take additional megawatts, because in many countries there are grid constraints. That even if you improve the efficiency of the power plants, you really cannot put these additional megawatts on, on the grid. So these are the key variables I would say we, we look at. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a scale issue, uh, you know, because the economics need to make sense uh, also at the end of the day. Absolutely. Uh, I see one last question. Okay. Uh, I see two, but we, we are kind of out of time, so maybe we can take that one and this one can be done bilaterally if you don't mind. Uh, Martina, do I have the liberty of asking two questions? Okay, we'll do two questions. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, my question is uh, for Dan, or probably for the rest of the panel as well. Uh, in, and I'd like to just understand a bit more of what the experience has been for building sector, especially when we talk about existing buildings. So earlier on this morning as well, last evening as well, there was a lot of discussion that in cities, buildings are one of the primary users of energy. And would this list be longer when we're talking about the building sector, uh, given the segregated, segregated nature of the opportunity, as in we're talking of really, really small projects? 
and the fact that in the private sector it's individual building owners who have to take those decisions and there has to be enough appetite for them to be interested in doing something like this. So what are the barriers in your view specifically for the building sector? Excellent question. Let's take the last one and then we respond and close it up. Thank you. I'm Lydia from Accra, the city of Accra. We've had a number of companies come in to look at our waste to energy programs, but most of the time they have problem with the, uh, how much uh, the electricity is, is sold at the national grid. And therefore, most people are not ready to finance some of these things. How do you handle such a thing? I guess that question is also for Sami, unless uh, Sharis would like to also chip in. But uh, let's take these two questions. Dana, the first question was for you from buildings. Uh, thank you for the questions on buildings because I'm actually a buildings engineer. <laughs> uh, so uh, that comes very handy. Now, uh, uh, in terms of the activities that the bank does in the building sector and built environment, uh, of course, we are very active in the area of energy efficiency in public buildings. But I think your question was more on how to address the privately owned units. Um, Actually, the bank has a very similar approach to these smaller projects because, again, uh, uh, as was discussed, the transaction costs related to smaller projects are, uh, would be substantial if we went through the entire EBRD approval process. Therefore, uh, we have put in place, uh, again, a similar tool or financing instrument, uh, which is essentially uh, a credit line, or credit lines in our countries of operations. And uh, we are trying to tackle all the issues uh, that are associated uh, with these smaller investments through the credit lines and associated activities. So when we look at the privately uh, owned residential units, quite often people don't know what type of invest investments they should make. Uh, often we are looking at blocks of apartments with fragmented ownership uh, where there is no legal entity that could take on uh, basically a loan or, or uh, even an incentive payment. Uh, quite often in the market you wouldn't find suitable technologies uh, and the legal framework doesn't sometimes even allow uh, uh, certain individuals or, or uh, housing associations to take on a loan. Uh, that's why what we do is uh, we typically lead policy dialogue in the area of housing associations to allow uh, this legal entity to uh, access this financing. Uh, we provide technical assistance to, uh, um, uh, through our, our local participating banks to the final beneficiaries. So these would be owners of uh, family houses or even owners of apartments. And we provide uh, financing either to individuals or housing associations. Uh, now, of course, uh, individuals or private ho homeowners um, would uh, associate energy efficiency investments with much higher discount rate. So they, they wouldn't the, the benefits that they would see might be even smaller than, we, than when we deal with municipalities. That's why quite often we also access donor funding from, uh, from some partner organizations to add additional incentive for these private homeowners to invest into energy efficiency. I hope that's it. Thank you. Um, anybody would like to, Sami would like to talk about the energy off electricity offtake issues with the yeah. waste to energy projects? W waste to energy projects in general are, are of course a challenge to, to become economic bec if you don't have a critical Scale. mass yeah. of, mm -hmm. of uh, quantity of, or tons of, of waste that's being delivered to the, to the site. Um, the one case where we have seen these projects happen, even though the economics does not make sense, was when it was an environmental health issue so that the government would intervene and say, we would have to do a, a covered land, landfill site because a dump, an open dump site is, has environmental hazards to the, to the, to the community. Um, in terms of scale from an econo from a equipment point of view, uh, there are solutions today that you can rate as small as 200 and 250 kilowatts of, of capacity of, uh, of power, to, you know, depending on the, on the amount of uh, waste that you have. It can go up all the way to tens of megawatts. But um, you can look at the collection system. Maybe if you, improve, if you have a more efficient collection system, so you get more quantity being delivered to the same site, and that's also an issue. I mean, there could be a company that's to be interested in the business model of just collecting the waste and delivering it to the site. 
uh, it could, you could co overcome the, uh, the quantity issue. But I agree with you, it will always continue to be one of the challenges, the critical mass of needed for, for a solid waste management project to happen. Thanks very much. Well, I think that uh, this brings us to the end of the first half of today's uh, discussions. I've had a great time <coughs> discovering that EBRD has an energy efficiency department has got me inspired to go and tell my managers the same thing in the World Bank. We probably need one too. I don't know where Rohit has gone, but uh, we'll catch him later. So please join me in giving the panel a big hand and thanking them. Thank you. Very much.